here's my topic, the use of scientific advisory bodies in the COVID pandemic. Um, here's my unnuanced preview. Governments do not follow the science. Science follows governments. Okay? Governments engineer scientific advice. So to ensure acceptance of this engineered scientific advice, governments have an incentive to suppress dissent. This is bad. We need urgently reform. We need to be conscious, however, also that reform is hard. Reform is difficult. I'll say now rather than at the end, reform is possible. We can see it. We have seen it. If you look over the millennia, the centuries, the decades, we have seen reform. So reform is possible. I'm not saying, you know, give up or something like that. But we do have to recognize that reform is hard. Okay, so I, the, I'm drawing on the literature and political science and uh, public administration on uh, blame avoidance. Uh, governments, you know, we kind of think of governments as wanting to take credit for all the groovy things they do, and governments do want credit, but they are often more interested in avoiding blame, because if you do something, there's a risk that your po po policy will fail, or even if successful, will be unpopular. Okay? So it'd be great if you can kind of unload, you know, blame for that on something, on someone else. There are many, as, as we all learned as children, there are many strategies of blame avoidance. Uh, but a big one is delegating authority to experts, okay? uh, which, has, which, which, which may be effective, but it has a problem. Because if I delegate the authority to, a, to a an expert or a body of experts, I've, I lose policy discretion. There is, however, in the right circumstances, a solution to this problem of losing policy discretion. Ad hoc, the word ad hoc we'll see in a moment is very important, ad hoc scientific advisory bodies. They can sort of take the blame, but leave you with, with that policy discretion that you want. And this is possible because they can be controlled. Okay. Um, so let me say a few words on ad hoc versus permanent scientific advisory bodies. That's an important distinction. So ad hoc, like the word you know would suggest, ad hoc, SAB, scientific advisory bodies, are created for the immediate crisis at hand. Examples include the famous uh, SAGE group in the UK, and then, you know, when the administration changed, we went from one ad hoc scientific advisory body to another. Permanent scientific advisory bodies exist before, during, and after the crisis. A very salient example in, this, in the context of this morning's uh, events would be Sweden's public health agency. Uh, so what are the advantages of having a scientific advisory body that is, that is ad hoc? Well, blame sticks to these things pretty good, okay? Because they're these salient official bodies. There's a news article in Nature in 2023 that I think uh, illustrates that. Um, they may be disbanded, created or disbanded at will. Uh, the Polish uh, scientific advisory body created for COVID-19 uh, started to squawk when it felt that the Polish government was not taking vaccines seriously enough. So the government promptly disbanded them and replaced them with another body having different membership. Okay. Um, so membership is easily controlled by this and other techniques. A SAGE membership over in the UK they're, you know, again, their their principal scientific advisory, ad hoc scientific advisory body for COVID. Membership was chosen for that meeting by meeting. Okay. Um, oh, now sage experts uh, are, are easily rep. Finally, sorry, uh, scientific uh, scientific advisory body experts are easily represented as an external authority. What button do I push to get the, the video to go? Okay, so so you heard Biden saying we follow the science, okay, and and uh, he said immediately after that short clip, he 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 made reference to his scientific uh, COVID nineteen 
scientific advisory board that he created as soon as his administration went into to, uh, office. So that illustrates how it is that you can kind of hide behind your scientific advisory body, right? Oh, you know, it's not us. They, they tell us we have to do this in order to be responsible. Uh, so it's an external authority. So um, ad hoc, so now very importantly, right, this is an important uh, bullet point here, ad hoc scientific advisory bodies can be controlled in part for reasons, you know, given in those earlier um, bullet points, thus allowing government to retain policy discretion. Okay. Um, this creates, however, an incentive to, to suppress dissent. To, 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 I'm, I'm in part uh, drawing on uh, Christopher Hood's 2002 article. To get um, the advice that you want, your ad hoc scientific advisory board must be of uniform opinion. Dissenting outside experts may contest the insider's opinion, of, uh, however. Right? So that's like this danger. Right? So, so if that danger comes to be realized, you may choose to suppress dissent. Uh, <clears throat> which you have this, this strong incentive to do. This is well illustrated by California Assembly Bill number 2098, which made it unprofessional conduct for physicians to give their patients misinformation and disinformation on COVID-19. It's a great example because it was signed into law by Governor Newsom here in California, and, and you know, it's written down. It, those are the words. There's no ambiguity in interpretation what was going on here. Uh, fortunately, somebody named Hogue and another person named Rossetti were the lead uh, plaintiffs, among several others, in, this, uh, in a lawsuit objecting to this on the grounds of um, First Amendment uh, freedom of speech, and they prevailed. Okay? So it, though, though it was nominally in place for a while, it never really got off the ground, as, as I understand. Um, but this illustrates how it is that we come upon what F.A. Hayek has called the end of truth. Hayek saying the, inter the interaction of individuals possessing different knowledge and different views is what constitutes the life of thought. So measures such as Calif California's 2098 Eight, thwart the values of the heterodox academy, open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, constructive disagreement, without which truth dies. Okay? So the stakes here are very, very high. We absolutely urgently need reform. Now, I have my own reform proposals, and I believe in them. I think these are very groovy. Uh, first of all, avoid ad hoc scientific advisory bodies. Right? you know, a piece of advice A number one. Uh, also, to help ensure diversity of viewpoint, interests, and discipline, I interrupt myself to say, on this talk I'm not making a fuss about disciplinary diversity, but this is a big issue in this whole matter of scientific advisory boards and bodies, uh, ad hoc scientific advisory bodies in general, and in COVID, uh, I have criticized uh, SAGE in the UK for having disciplinary narrowness. It's kind of a chronic problem. Uh, and you can kind of see why, because, you know, the narrower the discipline, the more control I have over the message. Um, so anyway, to help ensure diversity of viewpoint, interest, and discipline, membership should be vetted by the appropriate legislature, so parliament in the case of the UK's SAGE. This has been tried early on. We have a beautiful example of the Houston Crime Lab, which was tragically a kind of tragic joke in uh, Texas until they had reforms that included a governing body whose membership was vetted through the uh, city council in Houston. It's now an absolutely exemplary crime lab, may perhaps be the most ex the, the, most exemplary crime lab in the U.S. Uh, so applying this principle more broadly. Uh, also, ad hoc and permanent scientific advisory bodies both should adopt formal procedures of con internal procedures of contestation and challenge. So we should do what, what earlier sages in earlier years called for earlier crises had done in, in the U.K., which was to, to break in immediately into three three competing teams who go their separate ways and then come back together only later to compare findings and, and, and recommendations. Uh, and before any report goes out from the scientific advisory body, uh, there should be a devil's advocate process where a so-called red team is tasked within the body to challenge uh, whatever uh, may be in the prospective report to be issued. 
Um, okay, that's, you know, that's very groovy. I totally believe in that. I stand by my reform proposals. But reform is hard. Expert advice rarely matters. Okay? So the expert writes, you know, the policymaker recipe, here, do this, you know. The policymaker politely thanks the expert and then does whatever they damn well please. Okay? So this is kind of the, the, the crisis of expert policy advice. This is what makes reform a, a, an important, vital thing, making reform hard. And there's two dimensions to this, I think. Uh, there's the perhaps more obvious dimension of incentives. Policymakers often lack the incentive to do as experts advise. Uh, my original training, I'm an economist. Economists are always telling central banks, since there were central banks, don't inflate. Inflation is bad. Okay? But central banks love inflation. It's good for them. that They have an interest in inflation. So central banks chronically inflate. Um, so that represents the general problem of incentives. Uh, there's also, however, an epistemic dimension. Policymakers often lack the knowledge required to do as the expert advises. Uh, Mariana Matsukato and Henry Lee have an article. Matsukato, the famous author of um, uh, The Entrepreneurial State, they have an article in which they, they advocate having um, representatives of stakeholder interests on the boards of large pharmaceutical companies. And this somehow is going to make everything great because they'll represent these interests and we'll have all the stakeholder interests represented and then the social good is going to emerge. Well, wait a minute. Who are the, who, what persons are going to be the stakeholder representatives? Do we have the right stakeholder categories? Okay, even if somehow we think we've solved those problems, we now have our stakeholder representatives on the board. Do they know what is in the interest of their group or in the general social interest? How do we solve the epistemic problem? It's all fine to make this sort of airy claims of, you know, go out and do good, but how are you going to go out and do good? So there's this epistemic problem to accompany the incentive problem of uh, following the expert advice or not following the expert's advice. But, you know, there's more issues, too. Uh, the, the proof... Okay, we're in good time. Uh, the, the pool of university-trained officials uh, and experts is, certainly in this country, and I think more generally, growing more homogeneous, making it harder to create the sort of viewpoint diversity that I think we need on scientific advisory bodies. Uh, in the U.S., certainly, and I think this is more general, universities are, are, are very dependent on the federal government, including and especially financially. Over half of science funding in universities comes from the federal government, Federal student loans and Pell Grants, the former being the more important quant quantitatively, have grown tremendously. So here's a picture showing federal expenditures in, in inflation-corrected dollars, so there's, there's no inflation issue here, going from a, a billion dollars in 1953 to $41.6 billion in, in 2021. That's uh, federal funding of academic R&D expenditures. Um, or again, outstanding federal student loan debt, in uh, inflation-adjusted dollars, 147 billion in 1987, 1.4 trillion in 2017. So this illustrates the growing dependence, even just financially, of universities on the federal government here in the United States. So I think my unnuanced, my nuanced free preview was maybe more apposite than you might at first have thought. In summary, governments do not follow the science. Science follows governments. Governments engineer scientific advice. To ensure acceptance of this official advice, governments have incentive to suppress dissent. This is a big problem. We need reform. But reform is difficult. Reform is hard. Thank you very much.